Let's take a look at validation using Mediator. Hey guys, what is up? My name is Jono. If you guys want to jump straight into the code, timestamp right here. And as always, all the code for this video will be in my GitHub repository, link in the description below. And I just want to say a quick shout out to you guys for being such a great audience lately. You guys have been leaving heaps of likes, leaving heaps of comments, and it's been so good to see your feedback and see you guys actually enjoying the videos. So if you do enjoy the videos, be sure to leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe. Let's get into it. So what am I actually going to be showing you today? Well, I'm going to be showing you how we can use Mediator to perform validation inside of our web APIs. And this video is actually the third part of our CQRS and .NET 5 series. So if you haven't seen the first two videos, go and check those out, link in the description below. So I've seen lots of videos with people using Mediator for validation. And the one thing that sort of bugs me about those videos and every GitHub repository that I've seen using Mediator for validation is that they all throw exceptions when a validation error occurs. And that's just something that I don't really agree with. Um, I don't think we should be using exceptions to control program flow. And I don't think validation is an exception. Like we expect it, that's why we're checking for it. So in this video, we're not gonna be throwing exceptions and we're gonna be using a really, really simple solution to actually control the program flow and not have to throw like a validation exception. Let's jump into Visual Studio, let's get after it. So we're in Visual Studio. And one of the first things that we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be creating a CQRS response. And essentially what that is, it's just going to be a object that all of our responses are going to inherit from. And it's going to give us access to a error message and a status code. So we don't have to actually throw any exceptions to, to indicate that there's a validation error or authorization error, etc. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna create a new class here and I'm just gonna call it uh, DTOs. So the purpose of this is to purely give us access to status code and error message for each of our command and query, query responses. And the reason for that is because this is what's actually gonna give us the ability to not have to throw exceptions when we're doing validation errors or authorization errors, etc. Since we have access to status code and error message, we can set those status codes and return the response just like how it is without having to throw the exception. So now we're actually gonna be converting our queries and our commands to CQRS responses. So let's first do our queries. So we have uh, get to do by ID query, we have a public record response. And what I'm gonna be doing is just going to be inheriting from CQRS response. So one thing that we are gonna to have to change that we've done previously is we're gonna to have to change this to using uh, properties. And the reason for that is this line here is essentially a constructor, right? So when we call our new response, we have to provide an ID, a name, and a completed. But with our CQRS response, we wanna be able to just return the status code and error message if we need to. So what we're gonna to have to do is we're just gonna be removing this and we're just gonna be converting these to properties. There we go, simple as that. So we don't have to, so now when we create our response, it's gonna say we don't have this anymore. So I'm going to just convert this to using the initialization here. Whoop. So let's do ID equals to do ID, name equals to do name, and then completed equals that. Okay, let's now move on to our command. So let's go to our command here. As you can see, our command doesn't actually return a response. It just It's just gonna be returning an integer. So what we're gonna be doing is we're just gonna be creating a new record here. So public record response, and it's gonna inherit from CQRS response. And it's just gonna use a property for int ID. And what I can do is our request, our I request is gonna return a response and I can update our handle method to be that. Great. And that, cool. And now what we need to do is we just need to return a new response and our ID is just gonna be 10 again. So let's now actually get into the validation. So what I'm gonna be doing is creating a new folder just called validation. And inside of this folder, we're going to have a I validation handler. This I validation handler, this is gonna be our interface that defines our validate method so we can validate our commands and queries. So let's first change this to an interface and it's gonna be a generic interface as well. It's gonna have one method, it's gonna be a task and it's gonna return a validation result and we're just gonna call this validate and it's gonna take in the T request. Great. So let's actually create this validation result. So this is our validation result class and it's just going to specify if our validation was successful and an error message if we need one. And we just have some static methods here just to easily create this validation result, say success or fail. So there was one other thing that I forgot to, to add here. So in our validation handler, what we're going to be doing is I'm just going to create another interface here 
and it's just going to be an I validation handler. And it's going to be a non-generic, non-generic interface. And our generic interface is actually going to implement this interface. And the reason for that is I'll get into it a little bit later, but it's to do with our dependency injection. So now that we have our interfaces, let's actually implement a validation handler for our command. So I'm going to go to our add to do command and I'm going to implement a validator. So one important thing that I want to mention, this I validation handler should only be doing domain validation. It shouldn't be doing API level validation. And what's the difference between those two? So an API level validation would probably be confirming if this string is uh, is provided, like it's not null, it's not empty, doesn't contain heaps of white space or whatever. Whereas our domain validation is actually going to be checking whether this name already exists or not. So the API validation is more towards the is, is our request in the right format? Is it, is it malformed? Is it, is it good? Whereas our I validation handler is gonna be performing domain level logic. So this is actual business logic that the API shouldn't actually know about. So we're just gonna have a public class validator. And it's gonna implement the I validation handler of type uh, command. Great. And we're just gonna implement this interface here. And as you can see, it's given us the validate method. And let's implement this method. So this is our implementation here. So as you can see, we've just got a constructor that, and we're taking in our repository. And then our actual validate method is we're just gonna be checking whether, to, whether the to-do item already exists. And if it does, we're just gonna return a validation result of failed, saying the to-do has already exist for the error message. Otherwise, we're just gonna return validation successful, we can continue. Now that we've implemented our validator, now we can actually start creating our validation behavior. So let's go to our behaviors folder and let's create a new class. We're gonna call this validation behavior. And this is our validation behavior. So I'm not gonna be writing all this code just because it's gonna to take too long. It's probably easier for me to explain it and for you guys to pause the video and write out the code if you want to, but the explanation is probably the, the most important part. So have the normal stuff here. We have our validation behavior with a T request, T response, and it's implementing the I pipeline behavior. And one of the key things here is that we actually have a constraint where our response is gonna be a CQRS response and we can initialize the, the T response with just using the new keyword. And we have a couple of things here. So we have our logger, pretty standard, but we also have a validation handler for T request. So this is gonna be our validation handler that we implemented for our add to do command. So if we, if we run this command, this I validator, or this validator, sorry, is gonna be injected into that behavior. So back in our behavior here, you can see we also have two constructors. And what's the reason for that? Well, let's just say I run the get to do by ID query. We don't have a I validator here. Like we don't have an I validation handler. So what's gonna happen with this? Well, if we only had this, this constructor, we would actually get a runtime error saying that some services couldn't be constructed for blah, 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 right? And this is the purpose of having the two constructors. If the validator doesn't exist, so in the in the example of get to do by ID, this is just gonna be null. And this is where we're handling that here. So if our validation handler is null, then we don't have anything to actually validate. So let's just go to the next step in the pipeline or execute the query or command. However, if we do have a validation handler, what we're gonna be doing is we're just gonna be calling that validation, that validate method. And that's gonna give us a validation result. And if it's not successful, we're just gonna say, validation failed for request, error message, blah, blah, blah. And this is where that CQRS uh, response class that we created earlier comes into play. So usually around this time here, a lot of people would start throwing exceptions, like a throw, throw new validation exception. Whereas in this example, we can just return a new T response, set our status code to bad request and our error message to our error. And of course, pretty simple as well. If our validation is successful, we're just going to go to the next step in the pipeline. Nothing fancy here. So now that we have our validation behavior, now we can actually add this to our dependency injection container and also our validation handlers to our dependency injection containers. So let's go to our startup class. And I'm just going to add another pipeline behavior here. So we want our validation to, to occur after our logging. And now what we're gonna do is we are going to add our validators. So how are we gonna add our validators? So this is where our non-generic I validation handler is gonna come in. So what we're gonna be doing is let's go to our NuGet packages and we're going to install a package called Scruter. 
So what we're gonna be using this NuGet package for is actually scanning our assembly for any class that implements that iValidation handler interface. So what I'm gonna be doing is actually creating a new class called validation extensions. And our validation extensions is gonna contain one method called add validators, and it's gonna take in our I service collection. And this is where we're gonna be using Scruter. So this scan method comes from the Scruter library, and we're gonna say services.scan, and we're gonna be scanning from the assembly of the I validation handler, and we're gonna add classes that are assignable to the I validation handler as they're implemented interfaces. So one of the key things here is this little line here, as implemented interfaces. So if we go to our add to do, we have our validator here, right? So our I validation handler, as you remember, our generic type implements this non-generic type, which we're searching for. But with that as implemented interfaces, we're actually gonna be registering our validator as this rather than the non-generic version of that, right? And that's the key thing here is because what this is gonna allow us to do is as we add validators and as we add more queries and commands and add more validators, we don't have to go in and touch our startup class ever again because it's gonna automatically scan it on startup and register them all for us, which is great. We don't have to touch our code, it's all doing it automatically. So all that we need to do now is just do services.addValidators. And there we go. All of our current validators and future validators are going to be added with this one simple line. So if we run this now, we should start seeing log entries saying request is set up for validation or not set up for validation. And then we can know if our validator is actually working. Okay, so if I just do the get to do by ID, as you can see, we've got our log entry here to say our get to do by ID query does not have a validation handler configured, which is good because we didn't set one up. And if I run the post, if I just say name string, and as you can see, we have our add to do command is starting, validation is successful. Good, so uh, we, we successfully done our validation. And if I run this for like, I think make YouTube video is one, uh, make YouTube video. If I do execute, okay, so now we see when we're actually, when our validation fails, we have our validation failed for command, to do already exists, great. So it's working as expected, but we do have one slight issue though. If we look at our response, we can see that our status code is 200, but we do have our status code 400 and error message to do already exists in our body. So how can we actually fix that? Well, what we're gonna be adding is a filter. And what this is going to do, it's going to map our CQRS response to a HTTP response. So if our CQRS response contains a, a non-OK status code, such as a 400, 401, 500 server error or whatever, it's going to map that to the, to the specific HTTP response. So back in Visual Studio, we're gonna be adding a new folder called filters. And we're gonna create a new class called a response mapping filter. Okay, and this is our filter. So as you can see, it implements the I action filter interface. And this gives us two methods on action executing and on action executed. So we don't need anything in this on action executing because we're not gonna be doing any pre-logic for this one. It's only gonna be our post logic. So essentially what it's gonna be doing is if our result is an object result because it's gonna be an object and our result dot value is a CQRS response and our CQRS response is not an okay status code, then we're going to just create a new object result, put in the error message and put in the status code. So very, very simple. It's not doing anything fancy here. So we're just relying on the status code and the error message. So we have our filter set up. Now we just need to actually add it to our pipeline. So we go back to our startup class and what we're gonna be doing is altering this add controllers. So what we're gonna be doing is specifying some options and we're gonna be doing options.filters.add and we're gonna be doing type of and it's response mapping filter. Great. So if we run this solution now, we should now start seeing the 401 or the 400 bad request status codes rather than the 200. So if I run our post request again and do make YouTube video, YouTube video and hit execute. So as you can see, we still got our to do already exist validation error. And here we can see our 400 and we have our error message. So that's exactly what we want. We don't, but we don't want to be returning the status code in the body as well. We can just use the status code and we're not returning a 200 anymore when it's actually a 400. So great, 
everything works. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to leave a like, leave a comment and subscribe. And as always, all the code for this video will be in my GitHub repository, link in the description. Catch you guys in the next one. See ya.